<clears throat> Hi, this is a really a continuation of a previous video I made, and that one talks about how we should uh, examine the gospel in the Bible and really preach the gospel the way it is in the Bible. Um, you know, evangelicals will kind of load down uh, the gospel with all these cliches and phrases, you know, redefinition of the word religion that people who aren't in the movement, in our movement, understand, you know, dumping Christianese on people, talking about Jesus being a personal savior without explaining what it means to be personal and why it's important that it's personal. And it's just kind of a bunch of religious kind of go uh, language. It's kind of gobbledygook. And so, and, and you know, a lot of people are really religious about not being religious and, um, you know, just a lot of side issues that aren't really important. So also that the Bible doesn't teach you get saved by asking Jesus into your heart. Uh, there's a passage that talks about asking Jesus to come in. It doesn't say your heart. That's written to the church in the book of Revelation about standing at the door and knocking. Uh, the Bible does talk about being reconciled to God. It talks about Jesus dying on the cross. When, when the apostles present the gospel in Acts, we see they talk about Jesus dying. We, talk, we see that he's Lord, that he's Christ, that he, um, <clears throat> and that he rose from the dead. And that's very central, that Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the dead. When Paul tells his gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you know, that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures, that he died, that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Paul says in Romans 10 that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, that you shall be saved. He says that um, uh, in Colossians 2, being buried with him in baptism, wherein you are also raised with him, through faith in the operation of God who raised him from the dead. When Peter talks about baptism, it says, Baptism now saves you. He says, It's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, <clears throat> it's uh, tied, our salvation, our baptism, uh, our faith is tied to the resurrection. Uh, there are certain benefits we get uh, from being saved, and some of those benefits come through believing in his death on the cross, and some uh, from believing in the resurrection, if we're, if it says that if we're reconciled to God, the Bible says we're reconciled to God uh, by the death of His Son. How much shall we be uh, more? Shall we? How much shall we be saved by His life? So, <clears throat> we need to believe that He rose from the dead. And when you present the gospel, you need to present the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. The Romans crucified a lot of people, and you know, this wasn't all that common for these people to be rising back from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead in a very unique way. I mean, there may have been some other people crucified who rose from the dead that aren't mentioned in the Bible. You know, a lot of miracles that have happened. But, uh, I mean, we know one who was crucified and rose from, from the dead. And he rose in a very unique way. Um, and <clears throat> he's the first fruits of, uh, of the resurrection that is to come. That's another doctrine that we need to emphasize. I didn't mention in my last video. I kind of finished that up. Uh, you, you'll, people will ask unbelievers, are you going to go to heaven when you die? And, you know, the Bible doesn't even have that phrase, go to heaven when you die. There are a few hints at it about, you know, um, departing and, and being with Christ and things like that. But it, there's not a lot of emphasis on going to heaven when you die. And that's not what the Bible calls our hope. We have the hope of the resurrection. You know, we believe that Jesus is going to come back. The dead are going to rise first. And those who are alive and remain are going to be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And Paul says to comfort one another with these words. He says not to, uh, before that, he's, uh, before writing that, he says not to grieve. You know, when someone dies, we're not supposed to grieve as those who have no hope. That's our comfort truth is that we're going to be raised from the dead. So we're not looking forward to an eternity, eternity of disembodied bliss in, in heaven. Jesus is coming. We are going to uh, rule and reign with Christ, hopefully. You know, hopefully you'll rule and reign with Christ. But... Um, you know, some uh, th those who are those who uh, suffer with him will reign with him, and <clears throat> so we're, the the hope is in the resurrection. You know, we're not complete without our body being resurrected back, and our, our belief is in the resurrection, not uh, some sort of eternal life on the clouds playing harps as a spirit. And a lot of people think that way, even Christians, and, and don't even realize we're going to rise from the dead. So in our presentation of the gospel, like Paul's in, in the Acts, if you'll read it, um, it's very much, his is very much intertwined with the doctrine of the resurrection. And for the hope of the resurrection of the dead, I'm in these chains. And part of it was the situation he was in, that that was the, 
that's what uh, talking about the resurrection of the dead it was sort of something that divided the Sanhedrin on one occasion but it's also an integral part of the doctrine that he taught and that um, that the biblical doctrine that Jesus uh, taught was that there was be a resurrection of the dead so <clears throat> with all that said let's consider also um, the, the type of scenarios in which we often see the gospel presented and what I'm talking about is like miraculous stuff happening God sovereignly doing things revelatory stuff happening uh, it, it's it's fairly typical in the Bible for us to see that God does something supernatural or that people working in the power of God do something supernatural before they present the gospel both to groups of people and individuals and let me give you some examples the example of Jesus who is our example um, Jesus even said that he that believes in me the works that I do shall he do also and greater works than these shall he do and you know what that's an uncomfortable verse for some honestly that's an uncomfortable verse for me in a lot of ways because you know I, I believe in Jesus um, I haven't done everything Jesus has done but you know, I, I believe the verse and if I want the verse to come to pass in my life I better believe it okay I another approach is whoa that verse is too heavy to really believe actually what it says so it's talking about going on TV or something you know <laughs> but Jesus said the works that I do shall he do also and that's not going on TV that's like all those miracles and all those kind of things so some people just try to explain the verse away some Christians try to explain that verse away I don't think we're supposed to explain away the verses that are difficult that are tough that we have to wrestle with and examine ourselves over and consider I think some verses are meant to be tough and just leave them tough let them be tough and, and let it say what it says so anyway uh, so Jesus is our example Jesus did what he saw the father doing and that's a good example too um, and the father was doing stuff the father was working and it was an interactive thing so when Jesus did let's call this one-on-one -on -one evangelism he was getting someone to believe in him uh, who became his disciple apparently there's a man named Nathaniel he's not listed as one of the twelve some people try to identify him with Bartholomew though that because the disciples sometimes have more than one name or whatever maybe uh, it was um, Nathaniel son of Tholomew or something Bartholomew I don't know so uh, Bartholomew <coughs> Whatever the case, uh, Nathaniel, uh, Philip entered, um, met Jesus, and so he goes to Nathaniel and says, you know, we have found him of whom Moses and the, prof uh, Moses and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And then Nathaniel says, ah, can anything good come out of Nazareth? So he meets Jesus, and Jesus said, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. You know, there's no deception in this guy. And the guy must have had no deception. He wasn't putting on any airs. He's like, how did you know me? <laughs> You know, that's somebody who doesn't try to trick anybody. It's when you tell them you don't try to trick anybody, and they're not like, oh, yeah, yeah. They're like, yeah, yeah that's me. <laughs> so anyway, how did, uh, how did you know me? And Jesus said, before Philip called you, when you were sitting under a fig tree, I, called, uh, I saw you. So Nathaniel must have been sitting under a fig tree either right before Philip called him. Maybe Philip hadn't seen him under the fig tree. Or maybe Philip came up to him when he was under the fig tree. For whatever situation, the, the reason was, he had been under a fig tree. Jesus saw him, I assume it's a vision or supernatural or whatever. So Nathaniel witnesses this, I'll call it a word of knowledge or, or supernatural knowledge of Jesus. And he says, you are the son of God, you're the king of Israel. You know, <laughs> he's, so he's, he believes he's a Messiah. He believes he's the king of Israel. And Jesus asks, he's like, well, you be, because I said I saw you under the fig tree, I saw you. I, I don't know, kind of do some sort of uh, Jewish sounding accent when I say that, I, you know, because it's like, from New York yeah. because you I said I saw you under the fig tree you believe you know uh, so anyway so he's um, and and he says you shall see greater things than these so we see Jesus doing this sort of thing he uh, God or uh, does something supernatural or Jesus does something supernatural and through it someone gets saved we see that pattern throughout Jesus ministry because he was always doing these healings and miracles and even with the woman at the well, when he goes to Samaria, there's this woman, he's talking to her, he's talking to her about living water. If you knew who it was, he asked her for water. He told her if he, she knew who it was who asked him, he would give her living water. And then he tells her, uh, she sa he says to go and get her husband, and she, she said she didn't have a husband. He says, you said, well, you don't have a husband. You've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Tries to argue with him about the right location of the temple because they had a uh, Samaritan temple up there on Mount Gerizim and uh, had their Bible rewritten to support that. And so, um, anyway, she believed in that. But uh, through Jesus telling her that she had had five husbands and the one she had now wasn't her husband, 
uh, through that, she believed that he was the Messiah and led other people to believe it. So we also see Jesus, uh, an answered prayer, uh, being a way to get people to believe in Jesus. Jesus, before he raised Lazarus from the dead, he said, uh, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you hear me always, but for the sake of the people who stood by, I said it, that they may believe that you have sent me. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. So Jesus prayed a prayer and then told people, that uh, that he had prayed, you know, indicated that he had prayed and that God had heard him, so that the people could hear that and believe in him. So sometimes you can pray a prayer, God answers it, and people can believe in you. Now in Jesus' case, the prayer that God answered apparently was that Lazarus would be raised from the dead. That's a pretty big deal. So also he's doing a miracle and people are believing. So you can pray a prayer for somebody. Let's say somebody has a need and you want to share the gospel with that person. And you can just say, hey, do you mind if I pray for you about that need? Could be a, a sickness or something. Oh, you mind if I lay, uh, we do something in our church where we just lay hands on the sick because the Bible says lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So you mind if I lay my hands on you and pray for you? And uh, so you can do that sort of thing. If you pray, let's say nothing happened. So you didn't have enough faith or just didn't happen or the will the time of God or the timing or whatever you want to say it was. Um, <clears throat> say it didn't happen. You know, most people, if you pray for them when they're sick or whatever, they'll be like, thank you. Well, that's very nice. I mean, you're trying to pray for me. That's good. And a lot of people aren't expecting some lightning bolt. And if a lightning bolt doesn't hit or or they don't get instantly healed from whatever, they're not going to say your your faith is wrong or, or that your, you know, your religion is wrong or whatever. Um, so, you know, depending on how you do it, uh, people aren't usually offended by that sort of thing. Some people might be. You know, some people are offended uh, easily about anything having to do with God. Um, their troubled consciences are bothering them usually. But so a lot of people don't care. You can do that sort of thing. You've got to, I mean, be bold about that. Uh, people people usually appreciate it if you want to show some concern for them by praying for them, even if they're not religious people. So uh, even atheists say, okay, you know, whatever. So you, you, you'd be surprised if you asked to pray for somebody pray with them right now. If you say, can I pray for you? And then you lay hands on them and you don't tell them. You need to give them a little understanding because they think, oh yeah, you can go home and pray for me. Okay. But if you want to like pray for them right then and the leg be healed right now or the back or whatever, you know, let them know what you're doing, kind of coach them through it a little bit and you know, kind of get their permission to go ahead with it. Otherwise go pray at home. But let's say you're meeting with somebody regularly and praying for them and they're interested and they start to see changes. I've heard of testimonies like this. They start to see things happen and they're like, Wow, you know, they, they start to see things happen in, the, in their life that you're praying for. That's one way that God can move. They see that, like, wow, God cares about me. Wow, this stuff is true. And so it opens up their heart. So that's one way through answered prayer. Another, <clears throat> we also see, uh, we see uh, examples of like with Jesus, like a word of knowledge or some, some sort of supernatural knowledge that leads people to be open. Um, so there are people who believed in Jesus when they saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. They saw the miracle. They believed in Jesus. They saw that Jesus said these words, and Jesus said that he said that God had heard him so that the people could believe. So they said, oh, this man prayed, and God heard him. And so they put their faith in him. And so you can pray, and you pray in the name of Jesus, and then people see that. So we see this as kind of an approach to evangelism, or a, maybe it's God's approach working through people, however you want to call it. Uh, look in the, let's consider some of the evangelism in the book of Acts, some of the specific cases too, even after Jesus rose. You know, Jesus was doing miracles all the time and all this stuff, but uh, even the, uh, in the book of Acts we see this with the apostles and other people. So let's consider what happened. Um, <clears throat> God works supernaturally, then people evangelize. Or God works supernaturally through the people that are going to evangelize, and then they evangelize. So let's look in Acts 2. The Spirit is poured out. There's this speaking in tongues thing going on. Some of the people present understand the speaking in tongues. And so um, using that as a backdrop, Peter presents the gospel. This is what is in the prophet Joel, the outpouring of the Spirit, and he presents the gospel. So look in Acts 10. There's a big setup here. <clears throat> There's a, an angel appears to Cornelius. Um, he's been given all these, um, he's a Gentile, but he's been given all these donations and stuff. And that's gone up before the Lord. It was pleasing to the Lord. He, he was a God-fearing Gentile. He hadn't heard the gospel yet, but he was generous and the Lord uh, the Lord valued that. So he, uh, this angel appears to him, tells him about Peter. The Lord gives Peter a vision. And then uh, uh, it, the interpretation has to do with um, the Gentiles not being unclean. It's about all these animals and or that the Lord had accepted these uh, Gentiles. So then the Spirit tells him, 
to go with the men. And then their men downstairs, their men downstairs, <laughs> and they want Peter to go with them. So okay, so there's a setup, and so then he goes and he has this his own. These people know that Cornelius has seen an angel, and he's like, I had this vision. The spirit and the spirit sent me. I don't. I don't know what all parts of it he told. You know, we got to see what's written there. But so they've got this situation where they've seen that God has worked by sending an angel to Cornelius, and God has worked on the other end by the guy that the angel said to send, and and had a, put a God directed him to go on the other end. So their hearts are really open, and they hear the gospel, and apparently they believe it real quick. They hear about Jesus rising from the dead. They believe it, and the the Lord pours out the spirit on them. Um, in Acts chapter 8, we see that uh, not one of the 12, we see that one of the seven that the, the 12 appointed uh, to feed the poor in Jerusalem, when the uh, people are scattered because of persecution from Jerusalem, he goes down to Samaria and preaches Christ down there, and they pay attention when they see the signs that he did. Um, we also see that the apostles previously in Acts 4, they were persecuted, so they prayed for the Lord to, pour, to do signs and wonders. Um, we see that <clears throat> in uh, the ministry of Saul slash Paul, we see on one occasion that there is this um, other Jewish man who was whose name I think meant sorcerer, and they said he was a sorcerer, uh, a false prophet named uh, Elymas, and he was, or I, I think they called him a false prophet rather than sorcerer. After, anyway, whatever it is, so his uh, he was trying to oppose the gospel, and then <clears throat> the Paul, full of the Holy Spirit, uh, said that you're that he was going to be blind. And he was blinded right there. So the proconsul that he was trying to discourage from believing the gospel saw that, and he believed, astonished at the teaching of the Lord, after he saw that the man was blinded. So <clears throat> for a time, <clears throat> and he went around searching for somebody to lead him around. Now, also even Saul's conversion. How did Saul get saved? Saul of Tarsus, meaning Paul, the guy who wrote much of the New Testament. He was a persecutor of Christians, and what happens? God does something supernatural. The Lord does something supernatural. Jesus appears to him, and he hears Jesus. And then something else supernatural. Um, he needs to be baptized, and he's blinded himself. Um, and he needs to be baptized, and um, uh, the Lord speaks to Ananias in a vision. This man named Ananias has him, uh, tells him where uh, Saul of Tarsus is. He... Uh, and, Saul, and he gives Saul a vision of this man coming in and laying hands on him and being healed. And he gives information on both ends. So then he goes in. Saul's very ready to be healed and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He's very ready to be baptized. So <clears throat> this supernatural things that the Lord did. So it's a co cooperative thing where the Lord's working and the people are evangelizing. I think a lot of times when we're doing ministry, we see gifts in operation. That's been my experience. And if I'm doing ministry, like if I'm praying for people, I might get word of knowledge, words of knowledge, like things to pray that are about their personal life. But I'm not praying with the people that I don't see that gift really activating uh, very much. So, <clears throat> also, you know, people who do evangelism a lot um, may get prophetic words or healing or whatever. And part of it is, you know, you got to be open to it and you don't want to despise it because the Bible says, quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying. So if you have a really bad attitude towards it and you, you reject it uh, when other people do that sort of thing or you see it, you have a really bad attitude about it, you're not welcoming to the Holy Spirit to operate in that way. One translation says, do not put out the spirit's fire, where it says, quench not the spirit. So apparently it's, it's possible, you know, like if you go somewhere where you're not wanted, you're like, well, why should I hang out here? Or you bring somebody a present and they don't like it. Like, here, here's some uh, fruitcake. This is the best fruitcake in the world. And they don't like it. Then why are they, would you, uh, would you keep bringing the fruitcake if they didn't want it? You know, or, or uh, red velvet or, you know, triple layer fudge cake if they didn't like it. So, <clears throat> didn't appreciate it. So we need to be appreciative when the Lord gives us stuff. You know, it's like when the children of Israel got manna and, and then they start grumbling and complaining. The Lord didn't like that. So, I mean, I, I can understand if you're eating the same thing every day, but the Lord doesn't like it when you complain about what he gives us. And when you talk about prophesying and, and the Lord doing things like that, we need to be appreciative of that. We need to give thanks when that happens. Uh, we need to be excited about it. We need to like it, not be against it, not too scared of it, you know, because the Bible teaches a lot about that sort of thing. So I, you know, I've had an experience one time. I, I believe that I want to get the colors right. Um, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> I had a, my brother and his friend 
I uh, used to play hacky sack to do street evangelism downtown. Sometimes I'd go down with them. I wasn't very good with the hacky sack though, so <laughs> I could hit a couple of times, maybe three or four, you know, if I was doing good. But they they could just go on and on and on hitting that hacky sack, and that was their layback way of talking with these young people when they were young people um, and evangelizing. And so I go, uh, I went out with them one time, and it was like 2 a.m. or something, 1:45 or whatever. And my brother's friend, he said. Um, that it was time to go uh, go home. And I just didn't have peace about it. I didn't think it was God's time for us to go home yet. Every time they went out there, they prayed with somebody every night. But that night they hadn't, and he was going to call it quits. But I said, Lord, if you want us to stay here, um, let somebody come around. Uh, let somebody come here wearing, I think it was a green hat, red shirt, and blue shoes. I remember the shoes were blue. I don't remember which was green. I think it was a red hat and green shirt, I think. And my uh, my friend said, if he said we'll be here all night waiting for that so I finished my prayer Lord in the next two minutes and set this little stopwatch on my watch it's like if that happens I'm gonna pass out that's what he said so I was like okay so let's just wait for two minutes and the thing is I it's like I had promptings to pray that I tried it later you know Lord send somebody with yellow hat or yellow shoe, yellow pants or something you know just to myself I didn't say that out loud but I didn't have like the promptings to say that you know so this is like, I think, like a word of knowledge prayer. And and so, and I, I kind of had faith for it, too, because I said it out loud. And I was just like, let's wait, you know. Uh, so I waited, and sure enough, around the corner came this guy. Now, they had met this guy before, but he was wearing, I, I, I didn't know him, you know. And I, I hadn't seen his get up, but I mean, he's his clothes. He had a baseball cap on, the same color, I pray. Shirt, the same color. And he had these dark shoes, and we were under yellow street light. And my, my brother and his friend had met him, and said, and my friend said, hey, are you wearing blue shoes? And he went to this restaurant that was there, and he showed his shoes in the light of the restaurant. And indeed, they were blue. I got my blue suede shoes. Said So we told him the story of what happened. <clears throat> and he had almost gone up for this, like, a baptism altar call at a church he went to. And he hadn't done it. We prayed with him. Um, he, was, he was in some sort of trouble or something. He's 17 years old. He run away or whatever and we prayed with him talk with him and stuff so anyway the thing is um it doesn't always it's not always like a miracle but it can be just some little act of providence as they call it the Calvinists call it. it could be an answered prayer um and it could be you know you just it's just like you're just sharing you're just talking <coughs> and ministering to people and then sometimes this happens you know so if you don't get you know some supernatural miracle it doesn't mean God can't use you. God can also use you if you're just sharing with somebody. But it's just really cool when God does that sort of thing. We need to be thankful when he does. And I think it also helps our faith to realize that this is a common, ordinary kind of thing in the Bible. It happens a lot in the Bible where sometimes, you know, Paul would go around preaching. He was preaching in uh, Lystra or, or Derby in the Lyconian area where they spoke Lyconian <coughs> language. And while he's preaching... Um, he's preaching, apparently, probably people are just like, who's this guy talking? Then he sees there's a guy who has faith to be healed. Somehow, maybe from, maybe he preached about Jesus healing, or, or for whatever reason, something triggered faith in this man to believe whatever he was hearing, to be healed. And Paul somehow was able to see that the man had the faith to be healed, which also shows that faith on that part of the individual there was a key uh, element of the man being healed, is related to the man being healed. So, the man, he tells them to walk in Jesus' name. Then they think him and Barnabas are gods, and they're going to sacrifice to him, and they have to tell him not to. And then the Jews stir the people up after they want to treat these guys like gods, and then they run them out of town, so persecute them. So it <clears throat> shows you how people are. But uh, the thing is, they were already preaching the gospel, and then the miracle came. You know, one of the passages in, uh, I think it's Mark, says that they went preaching with signs following. So, you know, not every, God doesn't always have to set stuff up first for somebody to get saved with a miracle. Um, sometimes you're ministering and then some signs will follow or something supernatural will follow. Or just God does something cool, orchestrates something awesome to happen. Um, and maybe just someone will believe the gospel with just very humdrum, mundane stuff going on, except for the fact that the Lord has done a spectacular work in their heart so uh whether there's something supernatural going on or not uh it is good for us to recognize that in the bible that kind of stuff happens 
And <clears throat> probably, if you look at all the examples of evangelism, it happens more often than not. You look at uh, personal evangelism, for example. We have a few examples here and there. You know, the woman at the well. We've got uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And the, the, an angel had directed Philip where to go. And the spirit had told him where to go. Now, the eunuch couldn't see how supernatural all this stuff was. But you see that the spirit was at work. Uh, in Philip's life. So anyway, um, that's just a pattern that I wanted to point out that um, also take, you know, we consider Peter, the outpouring of the spirit and the speaking in tongues. And then Peter sees all this stuff going on. And then he responds with preaching. He preaches the gospel and the Lord has set it up with supernatural stuff. And then in Acts 10 with the Gentiles, the Lord has set up all the supernatural stuff. But if you look at, I think it's Acts 3 or 4, where he's in, in the temple, Peter tells the uh, the man to, that he's healed and Pick, grabs him by the hand, picks him up, and sh good thing he got healed because <laughs> he picked him up, uh, seized him, and lifts him to his feet. And the man's healed, and <clears throat> then he preaches the gospel. And he uses that. He's pointing it. What happened? You know, it's not because I'm so holy or so powerful. It's because of the name of Jesus. And he preaches about the name of Jesus and starts preaching the gospel using the miracle that God did as a reference point of something to draw the attention of the people and to talk about while he's preaching. And so we see that Peter did, did that sort of thing, and that was one of the uh, apostolic methods of evangelism. And, of course, in order to do this apostolic method of evangelism, God's power needs to be at work. And it's not about you know the apostles and their method or their greatness or their holiness, as, as uh, Peter would point out, but it's about God. It's about the Lord Jesus and the power in his name. So we need to have faith in God. And it's okay to do like the apostles uh, and to pray like the apostles who prayed that God would stretch forth his hand to do signs and wonders. And uh, they were evangelizing and they asked God to do that sort of thing. That's a good thing. It's good if God does that. It's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. So we should be thankful for that sort of thing. And, and the Lord may use you in a certain area. It could be that, you know, you'll, you'll pray for a lot of people and then stuff will happen. And then they'll open up to the gospel. Uh, there's a lot of different ways. And people have different gifts and different ways that the Lord can use them. Um, and I know some people are just like, you know, more like argue facts and ideas and they're real sensitive to the way people think and feel and, and uh, what their objections are to the gospel and use apologetics or whatever. And, and they use that primarily and they don't see a lot of the supernatural stuff. But hey, if that's you, you can pray for God to do some more of the supernatural stuff. And that's fine. It's, it's okay to pray for a good thing. So, uh, and also we're supposed to earnestly desire spiritual gifts. So um, anyway, my point is we see a lot of this in the Bible. It's okay to pray for it. It's a good thing. And this is one of the ways that the Lord works to reach out to other people. And hey, if you got any testimonies, maybe you can like type them up down below about something really cool that happened where either God did some sort of uh, work something together to orchestrate something so that you can minister to someone or share the gospel with them or to open up their heart or a miracle or a healing or something like that or an answer prayer. And how the Lord really did something uh, uh, great in order to orchestrate uh, evangelism uh, to take place and for someone's heart to be open. Thanks for watching the video. If any of these videos are encouraging to you, feel free to send the link to somebody else and let them watch it as well. Uh, thanks a lot. And also, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. God bless you.